On today's show, the San Diego Padres start off their two-game massively important set against the Seattle Mariners with a W, thanks to one Sir Yu Darvish dealing some pretty good baseball, as well as Fernando Tatis Jr. showing off the leather defensively for the first time in a while, and Manny Machado making history. Lots to talk about, so let's get into it. You are Locked On Padres, your daily San Diego Padres podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Greetings, ladies and gentlemen, and welcome to another edition of Locked On Padres podcast, which is part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day for Wednesday, September 11th. As always, I am your host with sometimes, occasionally, but certainly not always the most, Javier Reyes. You can follow me on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, or for updates on the show at L-O underscore Padres, as well as some like other Padres factoids that I retweet and share on there every now and then. And then, of course... Go check out my work at JustBaseball.com, a phenomenal website where you can read about my writing on the Padres, which will be returning very soon. And then Baseball vs. the World, another podcast that I have. Um, Go check that out wherever you get your pods. That returns tomorrow and should be a lot of fun. So, folks, of course, though, the most important thing is to talk Padres. Forget all that other nonsense. That's what you're here for. So that's what we're going to do. Let me first just say today's episode is brought to you by GameTime. Download the GameTime app, create an account, and use code LOCKDOWNMLB for $20 off your first purchase. Look, um, here's the thing. This team, like, guys, I, I really want to, like, have a heart-to-heart for a second and just say, let's, like, just appreciate how much of a joy this team has been basically for the certainly for the like the entirety of post all-star break period and then for a lot of the first half the first half was very like up and down but even the highs were really high and stuff it's just been such a joy watching this team and last night was another example and it wasn't because they had a walk-off win or anything like that it wasn't that it wasn't even because someone had a remarkable like an incredible game or anything like that it's just that you had a lot of different producers from a lot of different places and then you had some history right you had some history in the making with Manny Machado's home run we're going to talk about all of that on today's show first though I want to talk about you Darvish five innings two earned runs on seven hits no walks and five strikeouts uh looked a lot better than his last start and i don't even think that his last start was all that terrible we talked about that um whenever the last episode was that he started a game back against detroit where i felt that he actually looked pretty good and when you considered that a lot of the contact against him was stuff outside the zone i just thought that he pitched really good considering all that he's been through with the injuries with the personal stuff for him to come back and do that, I thought was pretty okay. And in this one, no walks was the biggest thing for me. I thought his sweeper looked especially good. His sinker was on point and also threw a couple curveballs in there that I enjoyed. He got two whiffs on them, actually, on the two times he had swings in them. He looked solid. He looked like what we usually get out of you, Darvish. And if that's the version of Darvish that they get um, in this stretch run, that's kind of all you need. And we've discussed this before, which is basically the ideal situation right now is that Joe Musgrove is back right? He wasn't great in that last start, don't get me wrong, but if you get Joe Musgrove at his usual peak of power is what we're used to him from so many years before this, if Dylan Cease can just be what he usually is and just be like that ace caliber player, and then you've got Michael King dealing the way he was, and then as your fourth guy, if you've got you Darvish going a solid five innings, not necessarily winning you the game. I mean, he is older. He is getting up there in the age. Thankfully, we haven't seen anything so far in terms of any like velocity dip. I think that's really important. Um, he's still throwing his his fastball at 94, right? Like, that's still 94, 95. Um, he actually touched 95.9 at one point last night. But I think that if you get all that and combine it with the bullpen, this Padres pitching staff really is capable of making a run. And it feels like the first time we've said that in a while. I know that that sounds weird, but even in the 2022 season, it didn't feel like the Padres starting pitching rotation was was quite, or not starting pitching rotation, the pitching rotation and the bullpen, including that, was quite this locked in and something that you had so much faith with, right? And I think that last night you got to see, not only did you Darvish work out of, you know, having a little bit of a slow start, giving up two runs for sure uh, in this one, 
uh, with a Cal Raleigh home run and then a Luke Raleigh home run. But those were kind of the only mistakes he made. It was just on two pitches, basically, against two guys that are known for hitting for power in Cal Raleigh and especially um, especially Cal Raleigh and then Luke Raleigh. So that's okay if that's what he's going to do. And Darvish has been susceptible to a long ball. He does get hit hard sometimes. The difference is that he gets so much good swing and miss stuff, and it's really hard to hit his stuff, right? But he can give up some hard contact. But I just really like that he bent but did not break. He stayed in the game, went five innings. I thought it was going to be a little bit shorter of a leash. You know, the Padres did have the day off yesterday. I thought we could see like a three-inning, four-inning type of situation here. But instead, he does go five, and he only needed 63 pitches for it, by the way. So if he needed to, if they wanted him to, if we're, say, in a hypothetical playoff series, which is what we're talking about right now, then I do think that he could have gone absolutely deeper into this game. But they didn't need him to because the Padres have such a good bullpen. In this game, Jeremiah Strata comes in, doesn't give up anything. Tanner Scott comes into the game and does give up a run. I want to talk about that really quickly. Um, Tanner Scott does give up a run, a J.P. Crawford single in the bottom of the seventh inning. But there was some questionable umpiring, some weird non-strike three calls. So that was a run given up by Tanner Scott, but it's one of those runs that like, and we don't have a stat to show this in the line, but it was like a little bit unearned. Don't get me wrong, he did get into some trouble, but that's expected for every pitcher You're to get into some trouble. You shouldn't be necessarily punished for that. And I know everyone's going to be shouting about, you know, robot umps and all that stuff, and I'm not here to talk about that, but I really think that that's even more of a plus for the Padres last night is the fact that basically it's just two mistakes from Darvish to Rayleigh and to Rally. Hold on. Rayleigh and then Cal Rally. I just realized two Rayleigh's. Um, those two mistakes and then an inning where Tanner Scott got into some trouble, but he was not helped out by the umpires and the fact that they did not call the strikes and whatnot um, correctly. So look, I thought the Padres pitching last night was super good. Yes, it's a Seattle team that's been, as we talked about on yesterday's episode, with Ty Dan Gonzalez of Lockdown Mariners, if you missed it. Yes, it's a very porous offense at times. It feels like they just aren't able to string quality innings together. But even still, you still love to see that this is the winning formula for the Padres. And I, for one, really, really enjoyed it. I think it was great. I think it was fantastic, guys. Don't you just love it when pitching is like pretty set in stone and you feel great about it you know what i mean doesn't it feel great i love it i love it so much um some other things from last night's game uh luis arise again multi-hit game three for five in this one uh seriously though like the arise thing is super exciting that's now three straight games with three hits it seems like they might be getting the arise back and guys if they have the arise back that's i think that's part of the reason why you haven't maybe seen donovan solano get as much dh time lately um if they get that version of him back, man, I mean, we're, now we're cooking. And by the way, Donovan Solano in this game, two for three with a walk as well. So he did produce uh, big time. Jake Cronenworth, two walks in this game. That was great. Jerickson Profar, two for four with a walk in this game as well as a double. And um, Profar has been like, he hasn't been bad. Let me be very clear. His 279 batting average just isn't a problem to me. He's just been a little bit less godly, I think is the way to put it. Uh, over the last couple months, in fact, uh, 787 OPS in September so far. He had a 692 um, in August. He just wasn't hitting the ball as well. He was drawing walks, which was great, but he wasn't doing anything. That's basically his only poor month of the year. And then you have September, which is his first month below an 800 OPS so far, but even still it's a high 700. So He's been very good. Still love to see him get those hits, keep his numbers going. Um, if you're wondering why he's not the leading uh, player in wins above replacement on this team, at least according to Fangrass, it's because of the defense. But all in all, just a really, really sharp game for him. The Arise thing, though, is the most exciting thing for me. Because that guy at the top of a lineup in a playoff series, a guy you know is not going to strike out. You know he's going to put the ball in play, and he could be a menace. He can go out there and get a lot of singles. Uh, I just think that like that's going to be huge, and I, I I don't know if enough people are talking about it. I really do. And don't get me wrong, he didn't necessarily have like the hardest hit data on last night's hits, but all the singles they all had a high expected batting average, except for one. Uh, uh, hilariously enough, the hardest hit one that he had a three ten expected batting average, but then six seventy and nine ten on the other ones. Guy just knows how to hit, man. And speaking of knowing how to hit. We're going to be talking about two very delightful superstars on the Padres and what went down with them and their great games that they had last night. But first, I need to take a moment with you folks and talk about the sponsor that we mentioned at the top of this episode, and that is the good, lovely folks over at Game Time. And let me tell you, here's the thing with Game Time. What I love about them so much, the prices 
They're always trying to give you the best deal, man. When you're getting closer to the game, if you go to some, if your happy hour with your buddies after work actually doesn't happen, and you're like, you know what? I'm going to go catch a game. I want to go watch the Padres. Guess what? If you use game time, you have a chance of getting all these flash deals in which the ticket prices go down before the game. They've got zone deals where you just pick a zone, they pick the seat for you, and you get a discount that way. And they even have a new feature called Game Time Picks that makes getting tickets for your favorite live events even easier. Game Time Fix filters out the fluff to show you only incredible deals on great seats so you don't have to waste time searching through thousands of tickets. And you might notice that I said events, live events. I didn't say baseball. I didn't even say sports. That's because they also include tickets for all sorts of live events, including concerts, um, you know, uh, whatever things, uh, concerts, uh, theater, comedy clubs, all that sort of stuff. They've got you covered, guys. It is really, really great. Go check them out. And as a nice little bonus, they even give you these little seat view pictures. You just click on the seat, and they'll show you what the seat looks like if you're a visual learner like myself. So what are you waiting for? Download the Game Time app, create an account, and use code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off your first purchase. Terms apply. But again, create an account and redeem code Locked On MLB for twenty dollars off. Download Game Time today. What time is it? It's game time. Woo! And just like that, folks, we are back thriving and vibing here on the Locked On Padres podcast uh, after last night's just lovely, lovely game. Uh, and one of the reasons it was lovely is because the superstars did superstar things. I already talked about a rise, three for five. Jackson Merrill, 0 for 4 in this game. So. Weird, right? He, I think it's fair to call him like one of the Padres superstars at this point. Um, not necessarily in all of baseball. I'm not saying permanently, but just for this team, he's been that good, right? Um, Jay Cronenworth gets the two walks. We talked about Profar, but this was the night of Fernando Tatis Jr. and Manny Machado. Let's first talk about Tatis because his was really, really great to see. And we've talked about this before, which is that Tatis has not had the defensive season. And granted, he's only played 87 games. I understand that. But he has not had nearly the, the defensive season that he had last year, in which he literally won a platinum glove. And it was one of the more astounding things to happen. It's not as surprising as like what Jerks and Profar has done this year, right? But all in all, this is still a guy that was an electric defender and has been inconsistent at times. And I know everyone wants to, you know, hype him up after last night, but it is fair to bring up that he had been really shaky. I mean, in Sunday's game, losing the ball in the sun and whatnot. Again, just to compare, last year, 27 defense run, defensive runs saved, 9 outs above average. That's exceptional, especially for a guy who hadn't been playing right field before. Then this year, negative 4 defensive runs saved and negative 2 outs above average. That's not good. But Tatis did show you that you can't really fake defense. I think that he's just having an off year. He's just been a little bit odd in the outfield. It just doesn't seem like he's had the same opportunities. But he fields a ball. In this game, that was genuinely amazing. If you haven't seen the highlight already, go check it out. He fielded this ball and threw it into second base as if it was a ground ball. Like, as if it was a ball hit to shortstop or third base and you're going to throw it at first base. Or just one of those type of plays and instead it's in the outfield. Him running fast as heck as it splits the gap, throwing out the runner. It was exceptional. And I'm hoping that we get more moments like that. I'm hoping that he shows a little bit, that he's a little bit more sharper. Uh, defensively because he's just looked a little bit off this year and I don't think that it means last year was a fluke I just don't think that with his athleticism and with those numbers that I mentioned I don't think you can fake a platinum glove I, I just don't think you can do that I think you can fake a gold glove right I think you could absolutely do that as we've seen with many defensive players over the year from Derek Jeter to Salvador Perez to even people being nominated, like our boy Juan Soto, when he was nominated for a gold glove, despite all the evidence being this guy is terrible, it can be a little popularity contest. I don't think you can fake the platinum, though. Platinum genuinely seems to be like, if you are an electric defender, like that's the guy who's getting it. So I don't think he's faking it. I just think it's been an off year for him. And in general, this has just been an off year for the Padres defense. I just don't think that this is... I th hey, look, this is why the, the games have to be played. Uh, I just don't think with Hassan Kim, with Jackson Merrill, with Manny Machado, with Higgy with Jay Cronenworth, um, with Xander Bogarts, by the way. Xander Bogarts, plus six outs above average at second base in the time he's played this year. Um, with Fernando Tatis Jr., yes, you have the Profar thing. Yes, you have Luis Arise. But for the most part, on paper, this should not be 
this inconsistent and and frankly just mediocre uh, team defensively. So it was just really great to see that last night. Shouts to Tatis, and also shouts to the fact that not only did he have a great defensive play, but he also hits a three-run bomb in the top of the third inning, allowing Luis Arise and Donovan Solano to score after they got on base. Again, winning formula. That's what it could look like in the playoffs is you get your Solano. Maybe he, maybe he gets a walk even. You know, he's able to draw walks sometimes, but he's just ripping hits up the middle to the side, whatever. Luis Arise being the pest that he is. And then you get just the ultimate danger of the fact that you're going to have a Tatis, a Profar, a Manny, even sometimes, depending on the matchup, hopefully not against a lefty, a Jake Cronenworth. And then you have some other some other fluff dare I say, of the lineup. You hope that Xander Bogarts can get over that 100 WRC plus mark. Uh, most of his value this year, hilariously enough, like his war, his Woods of Rubber placement seemed to be almost entirely tied to his defense, which is very, very weird, um, especially if you know the history of Xander Bogarts. But I'm hoping that he can get up there too. And then you have Jackson Merrill, Donovan Solano. It's just such a complete lineup that you feel great about. It's equal parts hitting, equal parts drawing walks, equal parts just not swinging at bad pitches, and then also power, aggressiveness, clutch, st star factor, and just mojo overall, this lineup. I don't know what... I'm really excited about last night's game. That was really sick. I don't know what to say. Um, we also talked about... Um, the fact that, uh, did I already mention, by the way, that the rest of the bullpen was solid too? Robert Suarez getting the close out in this game, one and a third. And again, we love bringing it up. Isn't it nice when your closer is like down to pitch whenever and pitch more than just three outs? It's pretty cool. But uh, yeah, last night, just a full, complete game for the Padres. The only bad thing was Higashioka striking out three times. That was bad going 0 for 4 in this one. But he is the catcher. He is the nine hitter. He's kind of like everything you get from him offensively is gravy at this point, especially when you think about how Luis Campuzano was supposed to be the plus batter that you had at catcher, and he just has not been that. And he's atrocious defensively, did not improve even in the slightest this past offseason. So anything you get him from him is gravy. But uh, yeah. Guys, that was lovely. And by the way, Tatis also, in general, he does get um, another hit in this game too. So three for two for five in this one, three RBIs, two strikeouts though. Um, we love it. Hopefully he can get it up there. I'd love to see Tatis, especially catching fire once we get to the postseason. Um, hopefully get to the postseason. Just keep that good mojo and momentum going. But yesterday was not just about Tatis, guys. Instead, it was about our guy... Jason Adam. No, I'm kidding. It was about our guy, Manny Machado. Um, look, Manny Machado. It's, it's really, I do think that it is not just worth talking about Machado's great season, but that I don't think that this was some guarantee. Because remember that the injury at the top of the season, he looked really bad. And it's not impossible, especially as players get older, for you to be like, what if he's just going to be a 110 or maybe like 105 WRC plus guy with good defense and you've got him until 2033 or wh wh whatever it is. I think it's 2033 is when the contract is up. It wasn't inconceivable. I do think that there were signs last year and at the beginning of the season, but even last year. And one of the things that I complained about was maybe Machado, some of his stuff, his hard hit rate was down last year. Right. And I think that that was worth bringing up because the injury we don't I don't think that it happened at the beginning of last year and at the beginning of last year basically for the whole way he wasn't that great I think the big thing with him was just he wasn't launching the ball nearly as much as he usually does he wasn't swinging at pitches that were how do I put this his he was getting more aggressive at the plate but it wasn't resulting in hits and it felt like oh no, was that MVP season like a little bit of an outlier and that he had a little bit of bad ball luck on his side but instead all the hard hit stuff, it increased. His hard hit rate is back in the 90th percentile as opposed to the 75th percentile it was last year and the fact that he was chasing, right? Like I said, and I think that what we saw was he just wasn't making the same quality contact. Um, that's the basic way to put it. Um, and instead this year, not only has the defense been, um, been, been slowly getting there, although the advanced stats, um, minus two outs above average is, is a little bit shocking. Um, but overall, I think that it, I just... To sum up really quickly, sorry, I don't think it was a guarantee that Manny Machado would come back and bounce back and we could just chalk it up to whatever he's Manny. Because I do think that there were some troubling things with him last year, with everything that I just outlined. And instead, this guy has been a menace for three months and he is now officially the all-time leader in home runs as a Padre. 
who's got it better than us. We're going to talk about more of that in just a second, guys. But first, I want to shout out the friends, the pals, the lovely folks over at Prize Picks, and here's the thing, ladies and gentlemen. Prize Picks is the number one daily fantasy sports app with over 5 million active members. It's the easiest and most exciting way to play daily fantasy sports, and unlike other apps, it is just you versus the numbers. You just pick more or less on two to six players and their stat projections and watch those inning winnings roll in. And right now, check out this offer. One Caleb Williams passing yard, and let me tell you, he only getting 94 on Sunday, he was a little bit close. But just to show you, look how bad he was, and you're still going to get a bonus with this deal. If he just gets you one passing yard, it gets you one win on prize picks every week in September. That's right, only one yard gets you an automatic win, so you just need a few more. Four weeks of free Ws. Don't miss this deal on prize picks. It is great. It is fantastic, and we love it very much. And it's gone when September ends, so go check that out. And you can check out prize picks every week. Um, including in states like Texas, California, and Georgia. And you can play against some celebrities as well, like Drew Ski, Joe Budden, MMA champ Sugar Sean O'Malley. They've got plenty on there, and they've got plenty of community tabs. They've got plenty of different deals and kind of uh, bonuses, I guess you could call it, every other day. Uh, It's really great, and they have a nice insurance policy so that your um, lineups stay in play even if one of your players gets injured. If your player leaves in the first half and doesn't return, prize picks uh, will... Yeah, um, your picks are still live, so don't worry about like if you're if you had a Jordan Love situation or if you just had some quarterback get hurt or whatever and they left in the first quarter. Don't worry, they got you covered on that stuff too. And now, if you just download the app Prize Picks, guys, today and use code Locked On MLB, you can get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. That's code Locked On MLB on Prize Picks to get fifty dollars instantly when you play five dollars. You don't even need to win to receive the bonus, guys. That's right, it's guaranteed. Prize picks run your game. And just like that, everybody, we are back here on the Lockdown Padres podcast, thriving and vibing into the final segment of the show. And I was just talking about how Manny Machado despite having such a bad start to the season, I really like that it seems like whatever was wrong with him was fixed because again, 633 OPS in the month of April, 610 OPS in the month of May. This was a guy with like an 85 WRC plus. I think it was lower than that, actually. Remember at the beginning of the year when we were like, what the heck is going on? Why is it only Jerks and Profar and Jake Carterworth that are producing? We can't trust uh, Manny Machado and Xander Bogarts, the guys that we paid so much to. Jury's still out on the latter of those two. But ever since those first two months, 904 OPS in June, 827 OPS in July, 947 OPS in August, and in eight games in September, a 965 OPS. He has been unbelievable for so long, and I don't think we're talking about it enough. Even Jerickson Profar, who's been great for basically the whole season, he hasn't had OPS numbers quite like this. He's just smoking the heck out of the ball, and last night was no different, producing not just in terms of the one home run that gave him the history record breaker, but he also gets another hit as well. Four RBIs on the Knights with the home run and with the single in the top of the seventh, giving them some extra little nice two-run uh, insurance in that one. Always love some good insurance. Um, really, really exceptional stuff. For those unfamiliar, the, ne- the person that uh, Manny Machado just beat was Nate Colbert, dare I say, an underrated player in Padres history that doesn't get talked about enough. And then it was Adrian Gonzalez, Phil Nevin, and Dave Winfield. So again, I don't think people talk about Nate Colbert a lot. He's just not all that known. And frankly, I didn't know about him too much until I started hosting this podcast a few years ago. But that is awesome. And I imagine that in the future that Fernando Tatis Jr. down the line is probably going to break the, the record that Manny Machado set because he's younger and whatnot. Um, but Manny Machado do that. He was amped. He was hyped. The team was hyped for him too. Really, really cool stuff. It was expected. Don't get me wrong. So I don't feel like this was a moment of like, wow, this is crazy. And it's also not that crazy because let's be honest, the Padres don't exactly have a rich history of having just all-timer legendary players left and right. You know what I mean? Literally, their best offensive player ever was not a home run hitter in our guy, Tony Gwynn, right? So it's not like this was unexpected. And it does show you that, like, Adrian Gonzalez, it's like, wow, like, I don't feel like he was on the Padres forever. Exactly, right? So I think that what we're seeing here is just the legend of Manny Machado continuing. He's going to be so, so good. I've seen some people talk about, oh, you know, they make fun of people who say Manny Machado isn't clutch. The only thing I will say about Machado that he is missing a little bit of 
is some of the postseason clutch factor. He has not actually been all that incredible when you look at his numbers uh, kind of in the postseason. And I'm not saying that that's like some awful like, wow, what a fraud. He's not clutch or whatever. But I'm just saying, if you look at his, his OPS in every month, he hasn't necessarily always been good throughout his career, right? In his all of his playoff appearances. But for the most part, he's been okay. Hey, in 2022, he was awesome. 824 OPS in the NL Wild Card, NLDS he had an 1100, and then the NLCS he had an 810. Like he was good. But I do understand some people bringing up that earlier on in his career, with all the noise, he did have some disastrous moments, like in the World Series with the Dodgers. Thanks, buddy. Um, when he had 390 OPS, he got like no hits. That was bad. Um, but overall, I do think that this guy has been a little bit dragged through the mud when it comes to all that. And I think that he's going to be a lot better um, when the time comes. And I'm excited about it, man. I just, I just, I don't know what to say. Really, really excited. And I think that, you know, it was weird. The wild card. Yeah. I forgot about that. The wild card series against the Cardinals. You remember when they had like seven home runs when Will Myers hit two and Tatis hit two. I'm going on a little bit of a tangent here. Yeah. That was a, that wasn't his best moments uh, with the Padres that, that series of the playoffs. He wasn't great there. He basically just hit one home run that was really lit in that game two of that wild card series, but enough about Machado in that respect. Um, really, really excited to see where this team goes. Really excited to see how the offense continues to develop. And I think that with Manny Machado, it really is, and I, I saw a couple of people tweet this as well, it really feels like he's our guy. Um, not our guy, it feels like he was the one that really started the new era in Padres. I know that technically what started this era of Padres spending and their outlook as an organization, and which is the most important part. We've talked about this before. I do not believe that you can consistently win without spending money. I think anyone trying to tell you elsewhere is ridiculous. I think Ken Rosenthal getting on MLB Network and talking about how, you know, the low revenue Royals uh, were able to, you know, put together a winning team while ignoring that they spent money on guys like Michael Waka and guys like, um, you know, Seth Lugo, right? Who's like, w was for a long time, like a Cy Young caliber pitcher um, for much of the season. And Frank, actually, I haven't checked it in a while. He might actually still win it. But like, I think that's ridiculous. But who really inaugurated that? Yeah. You look at the Will Myers extension. Once upon a time, he was ours, and we hoped that he was going to be a star. He wasn't good vibes, but he was not um, a star player as they wanted him to be, especially given the fact that they traded Trey Turner for him. And then you had Eric Hosmer, which the less said, the better. But really, it's Manny Machado. That's when it was like, okay, you paid Eric Hosmer, but we've seen teams that are a little bit low budget, low market pay players like an Eric Hosmer, a decent chunk of money. Hey, I remember when Mike Moustakis of the Reds got paid a decent amount of money and he was terrible. But Manny Machado was not just someone who got paid a lot, right? He got paid a crap ton of money in that first contract with the Padres, but he was also like a star player. So it's star plus the fact that he was paid a lot of money. So he feels like the one that really truly started to inaugurate this era in Padres baseball. So I couldn't be more happy with him being the all-time Padres home run leader. That's how, I mean, he's a Padre. And if he makes the Hall of Fame, which I think he's currently on a track to do, um, I don't want to assume that. I think it's weird when people start projecting uh, if guys are going to be Hall of Famers, especially in baseball when we know that players can fall off. Anyone who said back in like 2010 that Evan Longoria was a Hall of Famer, like, yeah, that looked like it was totally correct. And then he fell off, right? So I'm not saying, you know, knock on wood that that's what's going to happen with Manny Machado. But I do want to, you know, calm down. And everyone who yells at you, if you say, oh, he's, of course, he's a Hall of Famer. You're an idiot. Just give it some time. Give it some time. But let me tell you, it would be a little bit more surprising if he didn't because of the glove and the fact that he's already got 53 wins above replacement, which is, you know, he's closing in on what it takes to be a Hall of Famer. And he's basically never been a below average offensive player. The worst season he had was 2017 with the Orioles in which he actually got a little bit unlucky that season. If there's actually some articles over on um, SB Nation, I'm pretty sure, that talked about how like ludicrously unlucky he was that year. For a fun fact, he had a 328 weighted on base, expected weighted on base of 360. So like he got pretty ludicrously unlucky. And if you take that out, then it's like every other year, okay, 2012, he played 51 games. He was a rookie. He wasn't that great, although he was flashing the leather. And then 2013 102 wrc plus but he was worth five wins because his defense was next level that year right so i think that what we're seeing is a potential hall of fame player and that's really exciting 
right? Xander Bogarts, he's one that we don't know about. Fernando Tatis Jr. still got a long way to go. Jackson Merrill still obviously got a long way to go, but it is still fun to say that you have possibly like a future Hall of Famer on this team and one that will go in as a Padre and be remembered as a Padre, even if, say, his defense, I think, was peak though some of those early years with the Orioles, right? That's why he was so unbelievable. But uh, we love you, Manny. Uh, really love to see that. Hopefully keep ratcheting up those numbers after such a poor start to the season, seeing him develop, seeing him get back up there. Um, and not only, yes, I'm a little bit worried about the lack of walks, but hey, something has to degrade with age. And if it's going to be that he's not going to be able to get that 350 on base or 340 even that he was sometimes capable of or 366, in his should have been MVP season, then that's totally fine with me, right? That's totally fine with me. I like that the numbers are just solid. And this is a guy who basically, if he stays healthy, is going to give you good defense and 30 home runs. That's the way that you can look at it. That's the way you can look at it. And um, we love to see it. We love to see it. We'll see if he can add on to his uh, resume and whatnot tonight as they play again against the Mariners at 940 Eastern Time. Brian Wu versus Michael King, a great pitching matchup. This will be really cool to see and a little bit maybe of a preview of what it looks like when the Padres are facing some like genuinely like ace quality stuff. 2.36 ERA. Go check out what Ty Dane Gonzalez was saying with just almost throwing exclusively fastballs. This guy is not walk players, so I'm really curious to see how this Padres lineup uh, does against him. I'm really, really curious. So, with that all being said, guys, that about does it for today's edition of the Lockdown Padres podcast, the only pod that may be better than the Padres themselves. Remember to subscribe to the podcast wherever your podcasts from. Follow myself on Twitter at Javapeno, J-A-V-I-I-P-E-N-O, the best handle in the game, of course, at LO underscore Padres, at Baseball vs. World. You know what to do. Send me some comments or DM me on either of those accounts because I love answering your guys' questions, and especially with, like, only two games this week with another off day before Friday. Uh, don't totally that to do more mailbag stuff. So send in those questions and you can be featured on this show. But until next time, stay safe. And of course, stay faithful. My very faithful homies, take care.